Okay, we are live. We're live on the Fresh Crowd Facebook page. We're live in the Dental Marketing Facebook group. We're live in the Business Owner Mastermind Facebook group. And we're live on LinkedIn and Periscope today as well. <laughs> I'm Jay, that's David. And that right there is the original Zuckerberg, Edward Zuckerberg. And we're gonna dive into dental marketing and dental technology today. I'm gonna pass the conch over to David who's gonna introduce today's guest. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Merge Marketing Podcast. My name is David, co-host and producer, along with my partner, Jason Hunt. You're listening to episode number 60. Our guest today is none other than Edward J. Zuckerberg. He is a 1978 graduate of the NYU College of Dentistry. He owned and operated his own practices in Brooklyn and Dobbs Ferry, New York from 1979 to 2013, and has always been an early adopter to technology, introducing his first PC to his office in 1986 and completely networking his home-based office with broadband access in 1996. The advanced technology in the home helped foster his son, Marks, the founder of Facebook, interest in computers, with his wife of 41 years, Karen, a retired psychiatrist, they also have three daughters. Randy, former marketing director of Facebook and now CEO of Zuckerberg Media. Donna, who received her classics PhD at Princeton and is now an author and editor of the online publication Edelon, featuring a modern way to write about the ancient world. And last but not least, we have Ariel, who is a partner at a financial firm in San Francisco, as well as seven grandchildren. Dr. Zuckerberg now regularly lectures nationally and internationally on technology integration, social media marketing, and online reputation management for dentists, and consults privately with dental practices and advises dental and medical technology startups in addition to treating patients part-time in Palo Alto, California. He is a very busy man, as you can tell, so we are so happy that he took the time to be with us today. Edward, thank you and welcome to our show. Uh, pleasure to be here, Dave and Jay. Um, always happy to get the word out of, about what I do and uh, look forward to uh, helping your listeners and viewers pick up some pointers today. Awesome. We are also very excited. So uh, before we get into the the nuts and bolts of today's conversation, which is really going to center around social media marketing and, and digital technology, um, I'd just like to get your feedback on kind of call it the, the state of the union of the dental industry. What's going on in the dental industry today in 2021? And, and maybe what are some of the biggest challenges that dentists are, are now facing? Well, I, there's two answers to that. I mean, there's answers from, you know, an organizational and financial point of view. Obviously, the pandemic has um, hampered uh, the way a lot of people look at things. And some of my savvy colleagues are adapting nicely to a different environment that not, you know, is not just a, a function of the current pandemic, but I think going forward, we're going to be more aware of opportunities to, um, you know, put in a lot of virtual stuff. I've long been a big proponent of virtual. I mean, I hated tying up time for, uh, you know, really short observation appointments, um, consultations, things of that nature that can be done virtually um, from the convenience of patients' home and, and sometimes even the doctor's home. Um, you know, I know as a practitioner, I spent a lot of time um, in the office at the end of the day, following up on any patient that had any kind of surgical or sensitive procedure to see how they were doing. Um, another great tool that dentists can add a personal touch to by doing that at the end of the day virtually. Uh, so, you know, people are hesitant. Um, I've been reading studies about uh, the amount of you know, loss in patient visits and people are shying away. Uh, I know I personally put off my own professional hygiene visit longer <laughs> than I have. 
um, during the pandemic. And, um, you know, offices need to do what they can to address the fears of patients in returning to the office during the pandemic. Dental offices have traditionally been among the safest places to visit. I mean, even during uh, going back to the 80s when we had the uh, AIDS crisis and hepatitis and things like that, Dennis responded with, you know, really operating room quality controls in many offices, bagged, sterilized instruments, everything wiped down, disposables wherever possible, staff using masks and gowns and shields. Um, so from that point of view, the dental office is probably one of the safest places to go, um, but it behooves us to really reinforce that and I'm helping a lot of my colleagues use social media to get that message out about, um, you know, why that is safe and, and what they're doing to take extra steps. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have exploding technology in the dental profession. Um, everything from, you know, 3D imaging and new ways to treat, um, you know, placing implants with predictability and, and everything's computerized and the workflow is computerized. So it's really an exciting time if you're a fan of technology to be a dentist. And, you know, on the horizon now is the realization that many of the maladies that affect, you know, the population, um, heart disease, uh, inability to properly control diabetes, um, gut issues, even things like Alzheimer's and strokes and things of that nature, all have root in um, the bacteria that are in the mouth in gum disease and learning how to control these bacteria really puts the dentist in a position where they can uh, really affect huge improvements and changes in general body health for the population. Let's uh, I definitely want to dive into the future of the technology of dental soon, later in this podcast, but I want to circle back for a second, Edward, um, to talk about something you mentioned there a second ago, and that was, you know, offsetting those thoughts and fears that a lot of people are having there and maybe some tips or takeaways that the dentist or even small business owners for that matter can take away from this in terms of ways they can use social media to offset a lot of those fears that people have of going into businesses right now? Well, you know, there's one thing is to set up a policy, you know, and, and a protocol for how you're going to deal with um, making patients feel safe visiting your office during the pandemic, you know, and a lot of my offices, you know, have adopted things like um, limited numbers of patients in the office and, and, you don't want patients commingling in the reception area. So uh, when the patients arrive for their appointment, most of my um, practice is a suburban, people are driving to them, um, or even if patients are walking, they text the office when, they're, when they've arrived, but they're outside the office. And so the office will try and create a situation where the operatory is ready for them to walk into when they walk into the office, bypassing the front desk, any kind of uh, forms that need to be filled out, payments that need to be made, things of that nature have been done prior to the appointment and will be, or will be done post to the appointment, also virtually. Um, uh, it's known when a patient's gonna come in that way and so we avoid having a patient going out when they're coming in. Uh, so either we'll wait till the path is clear and the patient prior has left and then say, okay, you're ready to come in. We'll take you right into operatory three or whatever when they come in. And the patients will appreciate um, waiting in their car or on a park bench or somewhere outside where they can check emails and respond to messages and not spend mindless time in an indoor place that could be, you know, potentially dangerous to them. Would, would um, you use, how, how would you use social media as a vehicle to, um, to communicate 
those those procedures with those patients is it a vehicle is there is there messenger bots that are being deployed to let people know hey you have 15 minutes till your appointment please wait in your car are there certain things that that some of your clients or practices are doing to uh to kind of curb it um so you can um you know use a messenger bot to note that a person has arrived and checked in and have an auto reply um, that, you know, we will notify you as soon as it's ready, you know, the treatment room is ready for you. And then the staff gets alerted that the patient has arrived and the staff can then send them uh, a message on messenger. Um, okay. We're ready for you. You know, we're taking you right into operatory three. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly, um, there's a set of protocols that have been established offices are doing anything like, um, like I mentioned, curbing, you know, patient to patient contact within the office, um, using high speed suction devices um, to eliminate aerosol spray throughout the office. That's, that's important for staff as well um, mm -hmm. as patients. Um, and so the protocol is there. And then via Facebook posts and messages, can the staff alert the patients to their protocol so the patients can see the whole list of things that the office is doing to make it safer in the pandemic? For sure. And and um, just to go back to uh, to something I had read in your bio when I was introducing you is is you've been a, a, an early adopter to technology for a long time now, which um, which is great. But I'm curious, has the dental industry for the most part been slow to adopt to new technologies like social media or what have you? Or are you seeing different? So there are dentists of all different comfort levels with technology right. um mm -hmm. you know i don't know something about me i was always a gadget guy and um you know i fiddled with an atari 800 computer back <laughs> in the late 70s and early 80s even before i started dental practice and um i mean i everybody's going to react to things differently and have different vision for how technology works. I remember back in 1981 when my wife and I bought our first house, which was from a retiring dentist, by the way, and it had a small, um, small dental practice that um, became a satellite dental office because my main office was in Brooklyn that I started in 1979. And one it was 1981 was a crazy financial climate i mean interest rates were 18 uh, percent and going up and going up i mean nobody wanted to, banks didn't want to lend money we had a hard time getting a mortgage i mean our our home was a hundred thousand dollars that we bought and we had about fifty thousand dollars in cash to put down as a down payment most people buy homes on 20 percent, sometimes even 10 percent down and yet even with 50, 50, you know, 50 percent down. We were getting turned away for a fifty fifty thousand dollar mortgage because banks weren't sure that the rate was going to be twenty three, twenty four percent. They didn't want to lock into a cheap eighteen <laughs> percent loan. Yeah, right. So um, we finally, through a, a cousin of mine who was an officer at Citibank, were able to get a, a mortgage with Citibank. And not only did we get the bargain rate of 18%, <laughs> but they were willing to cut the rate another 1% if we did all our banking with them and tried this new crazy thing they were doing called online banking. But I, I don't know if it was called online banking. It may have been called electronic banking. Um, but you had to have an Atari 800 or a Commodore 64. Those were the only computers then. Uh, they didn't work. David, have you ever heard of a Commodore 64 before, David? You know, uh, like Atari, are you familiar I've, with I've heard, I've, I've heard of both, but uh, okay. trust me, they are well before my time. In the museum now, yeah. So they gave me this 300 BAUD modem, and I had a green monitor with my Atari 800, and I remember the first banking session vividly in late 1981 where the green monitor loaded. It was like someone was typing. The, the letters, it was that slow. The letters would go across the screen as the screen was loading. And I had a very limited selection of merchants to pay bills from, but the 
um, the Con Edison, the electric company, the phone company, and the water company that were preloaded and um, <laughs> paid three bills. And I was like super excited about this. And I had to like run and find my wife who was in medical school at the time, um, but she was studying in, in one of the quieter remote rooms of the house. And I found her and I said, you're not going to believe what just happened. <laughs> and she could see I was all animated and like, okay, tell me, you know? And I said, well, I just paid three bills, you know, on the computer, <laughs> you know? And she looked at me a little bit puzzled and said, how long did that take? And I said, uh, the session was about an hour. <laughs> and she's like, you know, I can write three checks and put them in envelopes and lick and put lick the stamp <laughs> put it on and be done in five minutes. That's and I'm funny. like, you don't get it. This is going to change the way things are done in the world. Yeah. And she was like, you're right. I don't get it, but knock yourself out. So, <laughs> you know, and then five years later, when I said, dragged her to the IBM PC product store um, to see the brand new IBM PC XT, which had 512K of RAM and a 10 megabyte hard drive. Uh, think about that. That could not hold one picture from one <laughs> of today's high end digital cameras on that computer. Yeah. Um, and, yet, and yet it was $5,000. Wow. And there was a, a piece of crap dental software that they were selling with it that was another five thousand dollars. I mean, I, I was earning about fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year as a dentist in 1985. That was a lot of money for me, um, you know, to plunk down ten grand for this. And and I have to tell you, it was garbage. Um, yes. So sometimes there are pitfalls of getting involved early with technology, but. It really opened my eyes. The dental software itself particularly was so bad that it really opened my eyes when I bought another piece of software for a fraction of the cost two years later that had all the things I hated about the other one resolved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a great stepping stone. Mm -hmm. But then on the other end of the spectrum, from guys like me, I was lecturing in Savannah maybe about six years ago in 2015. And um, it was an all-day talk, and, and one of the older gentlemen comes up to me during the lunch break, and he goes, you Northerners need to understand that we do things slow down, <laughs> and you need to slow down for us. Yeah. And I go, well, you know, I realize there's about 75 people here today, and some of you are, you know, down here, and some of you know a lot more, so... I, I'm kind of, I don't want to bore anyone and I, I don't want to be over anyone's head, but I kind of got to teach to the middle. So I have a little basic stuff in here and I got to throw some advanced pointers in. Why don't you tell me where you're at so I can get an idea how to gauge my talk this afternoon more towards you? And he's like, this is six years ago, Ramon. He's like, well, we're thinking of getting our first computer. Jeez. So I'm like, right, yeah, <laughs> you shouldn't do that today. You know, I didn't say that, but um, I, I can't gear to that. But that's the other end of the audience. But, you know, for example, certain technologies, like I was just blown away when I was first exposed to digital photography and digital x-rays um, in the late 90s. And, man, I, 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 I embrace that like... Wow, like that's like, this is like no brainer stuff. Um, and yet adoption by my colleagues was really slow. Mm -hmm. It took probably, I mean, where I thought it would be standard of care within five years, 10 years later, there was probably only about a 20%, 10 to 15, 20% saturation of digital radiography used by my colleagues. You know, and in my early years when I would, meet colleagues and discuss with them about, see what I saw, this through my eyes, digital x-ray, first thing I noticed is that, okay, the image quality is maybe 80% as good as a film. Um, so that's, that's a slight negative, but I know the technology is gonna grow and, and the company that I worked with back in 1998 um, actually 
um, gave me a really good deal um, and, and on, ongoing complimentary um, support and maintenance because they used to send me images on a weekly basis and I would help them tweak their software by, you know, um, giving them the point of view of a dentist of what looked clearer, what was more desirable for dentists, things like that. But one of the most frustrating things for me as a dentist is I've got a new patient. I know what they need. Um, and now I've got to sell them and explain to them why they should go ahead um, mm -hmm. with the care that they need. And for a lot of patients, dentistry is expensive, you know, even patients with insurance. Mm -hmm. And dentists usually find themselves somewhere down the list, you know, with things like basic stuff like rent, obviously, putting food on the table, um, but then there's car payments and vacations they want to plan for and stuff. So dentistry is competing for, um, you know, optional dollars, you know, where they have choices, where are they going to do that crown or that cosmetic work or that root canal, maybe they'll extract the tooth instead if that's cheaper. Um, so part of winning the patient over and helping them understand the dental disease in their mouth requires visuals. Right. And, and we had intraoral cameras, which again, I was an early adopter on back in the late eighties. I had cameras that I could stick inside patient's mouth and take full frame photos of their teeth. Um, and, and we had x-rays, which could see inside teeth, that you, things that you can't see visually. And to try and portray to a patient on an x-ray that's about a one-inch square piece of film, even if you use a magnifying glass over it, they can't see what you see. No. And now with the digital x-ray, I'm seeing, I, I immediately put... 21 inch monitors mounted on every dental chair. So now when I take an x-ray, all of a sudden the image that was tiny is now I can blow up a tooth to the whole size of the screen in front of them. And all of a sudden that cavity that needs a filling or a tooth needs a repair looks like a cancer on the screen. Yeah. I mean, they see a hole, it looks horrible, you know, and, and they want it, they want it fixed yesterday. And, and, and guess what? Dentistry now gets bumped up above everything else. And I saw that, but my colleagues didn't see it. And they would ask me questions like, hey, Ed, you paid $15,000 for this new digital x-ray system. How are you going to recover that? Are you going to take more x-rays? Are you going to charge more for your x-rays? And I'm going, no, um, not even a factor. Same number, same, you know, and, and I said, well, for one thing, I'm delivering, I'm reducing the radiation to the patient by 70% by using digital x-rays because the sensors are that much more sensitive than dental film. I can tone down the strength of the x-ray beam on, on the tooth and get expose an image with 70% less radiation. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, that's all well and good, but how do I take that to the bank and pay for that 15000 And And I... I could not get that they 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 there's you know selling more cases and getting greater patient acceptance is a an intangible. Mm -hmm. It's it's something you have to have the vision to see that that's going to convert maybe a hundred thousand dollars more treatment for you each year. That mm -hmm. makes this a no brainer. But I realized to be successful in discussing technology with my colleagues, I had to hit them with more concrete things on how to evaluate the return on investment or what we call the ROI on, on investments in technology. Mm -hmm. So I would ask them questions like, well, I don't buy film because I'm digital. How much film do you buy a year? And they had no idea. Dentists are horrible business people. They have no idea what they spend money on, what their lab bills are, what their <laughs> Them. So we broke it down. We figured out roughly how many x-rays the office took on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. We extrapolated over to a year, and we figured out that most single practitioner dentists um, were probably spending about $4,000 a year in film, in dental film purchases. And then we talked about um, developing costs. 
uh, you know, the cost, you, you got to spend about 15 minutes putting x-rays either through a machine, which is pretty expensive, that auto develops the films, um, or you have to have these tanks with fixer and developer where you dunk it in the fixer, dunk it in the developer, and then you hang it in them up wet. And, you know, if you're a dentist and you need to look at the x-ray quickly and it's wet, you lift it up and guess what? You're wearing a white jacket and fix your <laughs> jacket. And that's, you're going to go through jackets like crazy, right? Um, yeah. If you're using disposable, you know, that's another story, but um, I, I can't tell you my, my, Dry cleaning bills and my bills for replacing staff gowns and jackets from fixer stains is off the wall. Plus, what about the elephant in the wall? The 15 minute, even if you're putting them through the machine that delivers dry x rays, it's a 15 minute cycle. So, what am I supposed to do in that 15 minute period where I'm waiting for the films to come out and I can't do my diagnosis with the patient? Mm. If I've got call to make or a patient in another room, I can see a patient for that 15 minutes and then the assistant can say, okay, we're ready. Mm -hmm. um, or what happens more often than not is you wind up sitting in the room schmoozing with the patient about their sick dog or their recent vacation, which is great <laughs> for developing rapport, but people don't want to sit for the most part in the dental office a minute longer than they have to. <laughs> um, so Add up 15 minutes dead time times several times a day, and that's an hour or more of production a day lost. So, but that's an intangible that if you don't see that, you don't have the vision for that kind of thing, you're just not getting how technology works. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit, Edward, about uh, winning the patient over. You brought that up there a second ago. Winning the patient over, but the challenge of adapting for your colleagues is super slow. So how can a dental practice use technology, use social media to win that patient over? So let's fast forward to 2008, where I decided to make the jump into CAD CAM technology. Um, up until 2008, the pretty much only way to do a crown, um, the dentist drilled the tooth, he made a temporary crown for the patient. The patient went home. Um, the impression went to the laboratory. The laboratory fabricated the crown. The patient came back a week, 10 days later. If it's a live tooth, then it's got to give the patient another shot to get him numb. Um, mm -hmm. The patient's been generally uncomfortable for about a week with a temporary. If they eat sticky foods, it's stuck to it, maybe even pulled it off. There might have even been an extra visit to re-cement the temporary crown in the office, taking the doctor's time and cost for disposables for that non-paying visit. Um, so CAD CAM represented a way for a dentist to prepare the tooth as they normally would, scan it in the mouth, um, send the data from the structure of the tooth to a milling machine that would then mill a crown in about 15 minutes from a block of ceramic. And the dentist 15 minutes later has the crown in his hand, cements it in and the patient leaves in one appointment. So you've got a terrific technology. You've got a patient who's amazed at the technology and who's bonded with you and has now, um, you know, your, the patient's confidence in you as a practitioner is reinforced with the use of technology. But the number of patients in your practice that have been exposed to the technology is limited to the patients who need the service. Social media now becomes a way for us to let other patients know. So I, the company that I, I purchased it from made a whole big deal to me that as part of the package, they were going to make a great page for my website about CAD CAM technology. That's going to really explain to my patients what we're doing and, and it's going to really add value to having this device in my office. Well, I thought about it and I said, well, that's garbage because these people are patients of mine already that I want to reach. Yeah. And basically the only people who visit a dentist's website 
are people who are looking for a new dentist. So they're doing Google searches or whatnot. They're coming up with a number of dentists in their area. They're going to find, narrow their search to a few. They're going to click. They're going to look at your website and try and get an overview of what you, you do. And it's all well and cool if you've got some neat technology like CAD CAM in there. But, and that might help you win a new patient over. But it's not going to do a damn thing for people who are already patients of the practice. They're not going back to your website on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to bookmark Dr. Zuckerberg's dental office page, which is painlessdrz.com, and go there every week and say, hey, let's see what the, what's new at, doctors, at my dentist, Dr. Z's website. They're not doing that. They're spending their time on social media. So if you want to reach them, you got to do it there. So I, being who I am and what I, I knew how to utilize this. So I created Facebook posts um, about um, CAD CAM technology, about what I was doing, explaining it to patients. And now I'm reaching them where they are. So now patients who may never need a crown will know that their office and their dentist has this technology. If they want to read more about it, my post will have a link to click and go to my website and go to that more detailed page on CAD CAM so they can read more about it. And, and at the same time, I'm driving traffic to my website where they might look around and learn about other technologies we employ which might lead to more service utilization in my practice. So um, in that way, we're going to reach not just the 10% of patients who might need a crown that we will have a chance to discuss CAD CAM with, but now we can reach all the patients who are on social media. I love that and they, strategy. And they might then, be, even if they never need a CAD CAM crown, they might then tell their friends about the cool technology. They might share the post to their friends. Um, sharing is an incredible underutilized dynamic that most dentists don't realize is the most powerful tool in social media. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get to the people who are fans of our page with simple status updates and boosting content um, to get to a higher percentage of our audience that already likes our Facebook page. But if we want to drive new traffic to the office and word of mouth traffic that comes with a referral from someone they know, then we need to expand our marketing to the people who are in the network of people who are already fans of our Facebook page. And we can do that via two ways. We can... Um, we can either target boost to the people who are friends of fans of the page, or we can somehow get shared content from people who are fans of the page. They can either share interesting content that's on our Facebook page, or we can get them to do things like checking in mm -hmm. at our practice. You know, yep. most dentists I speak to, the thought of attracting check-ins in their office is such a foreign concept. I mean, dentists probably, like everyone else, are checking in when they go to a restaurant and see like a cool dish. Um, I know um, a few years ago I was at um, Morimoto's restaurant in, in Las Vegas. And throughout the course of the meal, I kept seeing this flaming chocolate tort dessert come by. You can't help but notice it, right? I mean, there's a big fire coming off the dish and it's this beautiful chocolate dessert. And they set it down in front of someone. And if you watch, the first thing that happens is people pull out their cell phones and take pictures of this flaming chocolate tort. And then what are they gonna do with it? Of course, they're gonna share it to their friends and they're gonna tag that they're at Morimoto's Las Vegas. It's free, um, you know, free advertising, free marketing for Morimoto. And um, how does it, how, 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 you know, I love that. 
<laughs> you know, it's great. It, it's food photography. It's it's food porn, whatever you want to call it. But how do you get a dental patient to take something that's, I'm going to take a picture of this while I'm at the dentist's office. How do you convey that to a patient and entice them to take that photo? There you go. So it's got to be, pardon the word, uh, the professional word is incentivize. <laughs> um, the non-professional word is bribe. Okay. <laughs> so so I'll give you I'll give you a story of how check in in the dental office was born because it was born in my office. Okay, so in 2010, first of all, pages for Facebook um, didn't appear until 2008. Um, Facebook itself was born 2004. Last month, they enjoyed their 17th anniversary. Um, mm -hmm. Originally, as most of us know the story, only in college campuses. Eventually, I think by 2006, it rolled out to the general public. And in 2008, Pages, which is a business application, um, the main difference between a personal presence on Facebook and a page is that personal presence um, requires a two-way handshake. Someone's got to send someone an invite, someone's got to accept, and now you're connected and you're friends. And you can also, when you post content on your personal page, you um, can restrict who sees it. Um, you can restrict it to just friends. You can restrict it to friends except people you've dubbed as acquaintances if you don't want all your friends to see it. Um, you can, if you want friends plus friends of friends or the general public. I don't recommend doing the general public for personal posts. Um, for some people, it may not matter. For people in the limelight, like myself, you know, I kind of have to do it. Yeah. Uh, with a business page, it's the opposite. Business pages is a one-way connection. All people have to do is click the like button, and they're connected to the business page. There's no back and forth. You wouldn't want there to be. As a de as a business owner, you want as many people liking your page as possible. So now, to your question, how do we get them to check in? Well, back in 2010, we were getting, at that time, as most dental offices probably do, lots of samples. And one of the samples we got was a case on a pretty much monthly basis of 36 tubes, one ounce size of Aquafresh toothpaste. And um, my hygienist probably did about 150 checkup visits a month where at the end of the visit, she hands the patient a bag, and in the bag would be um, an embossed toothbrush with Edward Zuckerberg DDS and the office phone number on it. A little loop um, bag. Yeah, you know, a little disposable thing of dental floss. And, you know, and so we want to incentivize care, you know. And, and you know, we were kind of like a high-end practice, so um, a lot of people appreciate that kind of knickknack even though it's only a couple of bucks you know it, it it ensured that you know what i wanted them to think is that if they would do for a checkup in three months and if it they might put that checkup off to four months but if they're looking at their toothbrush and it's starting to look like the red sea you know <laughs> roses part of it yeah. um they might say, hey, I should go in and get my cleaning at Dr. Z's office. I need a new toothbrush. It's kind of like a reminder that I need a new brush, you know, and instead of going to Walgreens and spending three or four bucks, you know, they can get a freebie at Dr. Z's office. <laughs> so, so they got that for free anyway. And the first 36 patients of the month also got a tube of toothpaste. Right, a one ounce, you know, those are good for like travel, you know, you throw in your bag, they don't take up that much room, you know, you can't rely on the Marriott to give out free toothpaste and <laughs> you don't want to be somewhere and you can't brush or whatnot. So on this particular day, somebody hit a couple extra zeros, I'm not sure what happened, but they, poor UPS guy, and I say poor UPS guy because we were up a lot of flights of stairs. <laughs> and he goes, I got 100 cases of these for you. And I'm like, what the hell are we going to do with 100 cases? You know, and the, my, the first thought that came to my mind is let's call up the local churches and synagogues because I knew they do these midnight runs and they're looking for donations. And, you know, they can give away a lot of this toothpaste to the, to the homeless people. Mm -hmm. um, and then I said to my receptionist, well, 
Let's try a Facebook check-in promotion. Forget about a free tube. How about a free case of 36 one-ounce samples? That's like set for vacation to a <laughs> life, right. right? Okay? And if I tell you within a week, 42 of those suckers were gobbled up. Now, there's one thing you should know about a check-in. When someone checks in at a business, that's not a post originating from painless DRZ, okay, or from the dental office. And so it's not going to all the fans of my page. It's going to the, on average, 250 people that that person is friendly with on Facebook. That's who sees their post because it's their post and it's their personal content. And so now their, their friends are seeing that John or Mary or whoever it is that checked in, checked in at then Dr. Zuckerberg's dental office. Well, why the hell are they putting on Facebook? They're not finding out that they got a free case of no. <laughs> so What it looks like to them is they're screaming out that I use Edward Zuckerberg as my dentist. He's great, and you should use him too. It's okay. like old word of mouth referral. And in fact, even funnier than that, um, we had a woman who was getting a tooth pulled, and a friend of hers came along with her to, to drive her. And the friend says, I'm not a patient here. Can I get a case of toothpaste also? And my receptionist being pretty much onto the game goes, hey, do you check in on, you have a Facebook page, a Facebook account, check in and here it is. So now <laughs> potentially getting 250 word of mouth referrals from someone who's not even a patient of mine. So, so not everybody's got 100 cases of toothpaste lying around. So oh, they better um, go get them. They better go get them. Now they better go get them. The point is, what is a new patient worth to you and how much are you spending to acquire new patients? So, um, you know, I look around offices and I look at the stuff they give away. They give away, like me, toothbrushes, um, you know, with your name on it. They give away water bottles. I mean... Really? A water bottle with your name on it that probably costs you like five bucks? You know, why? You know, when was the last time someone came up to you in the gym and goes, hey, can I see your water bottle? I need a new dentist. And I heard dentists give out these water bottles and I want to know who you use as a dentist. Well, that's just not happening. Okay. Uh, uh, stickers, um, toothpaste tube ringers, um, the stuff that dentists give away with their name engraved on it is over the top. And then these bags, okay? So maybe not so much with the pandemic because everybody's getting groceries delivered now. But prior to the pandemic, I know in California, they charge 10 cents a bag, um, you know, and it's good to save the environment. So we all embrace these reusable grocery bags. And I think if you opened a random trunk in a car in California that's probably on average about 20 bags. So dentists giving away bags with their name on it, cool. So what I tell dentists is, hey, look at all this schlock that you're giving away and getting nothing back. How about if you put a swag bag together with all this crap and put it in one of these grocery bags and now you got about $25 worth of stuff and you have it out <clears throat> on the counter and you entice people to check in with a free swag bag. 25 bucks to reach 250 people that know that their friend uses you and obviously thinks enough of you to share your name with them. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is huge and and uh, I love this so much because there's so much to these platforms and there's so much that I can do. But here we are having a conversation about one of the simplest but most effective in this case uh, features that Facebook might have. And one that is probably the most under underutilized today is, is check-ins. And it's great that you can um, incentivize your patients to, to do this. But something that just came to my mind is maybe you could even use a Facebook check-in as a way for your patients to let you know 
that you've now arrived and you're out in the parking lot and you're waiting for the, for them to come in. I don't know if the timing would work out, but but there's another idea and it's just such a cool uh, cool cool concept that you yeah, brought. I, I don't, I, don't I mean, that's kind of like them notifying the office, but I don't think they want to broadcast to all their friends that they just checked in at the office. So I don't think they would use that vehicle for that purpose. Yeah. Um, but certainly there could, you know, a, a messenger bot is a great idea for that. Um, yeah. Again, there's no incentive for them. You're going to have to do the old payola to get them to do it. Now, some offices have tried contests. Mm -hmm. Like they don't want to give every check-in a Sonicare. You know, those things can be pretty pricey. Even at bulk rate, they're going to cost dental offices 50, 60 bucks for a Sonicare. So mm -hmm. they don't want to give anyone. Give it. But... What they do is check in for a um, um, for our weekly Sonicare giveaway contest. I, I hate that to be just to be clear, because people think that they're not going to win a contest and they won't see it. For for a check in promotion to work, in my mind, it's got to be instant gratification. They got to get what they want, right? They got to walk out with it right there be it that swag bag or or one of my startup companies had this cool thing called a, a floss time. It's like a an automated floss dispenser that has a cutter and it dispenses 18 inches of floss automatically and it it gives you a it glows with a green smile when you finish flossing. <laughs> you haven't flossed for 24 hours, it glows red at you to remind you to floss. And Dennis could get those in bulk for like eight to 10 bucks. And that's like a great, you know, um, and, and I'm sure there's all kinds of things you could think of, you know, in that five to $25 acquisition range that would make it a great ploy. Talking about acquisition, just for a second, uh, because I do want to talk about the elephant in the room here, which is Facebook lead generation. And a lot of dental practices are using it to generate leads, and they're failing on the follow through of closing those leads. So it's creating this misconception that Facebook leads are just really not that good. Would you agree with that statement, or do you think there's a certain level of nurturing that has to happen at the at the dental office to manufacture that? Yeah, thing? the. the office the offices are not that savvy when it comes to the high end, you know, tools like um, pixels. Um, Facebook provides a free pixel so that when you have an ad program, um, you can then analyze through the pixel and see just how effective a campaign are. I can't tell you how many offices have too broad a tracking on their new patients. So, you know, when a patient comes in or a new patient or they fill out a form, you know, for for electronic marketing, they've got a category internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, that might have worked 10, 15 years ago. But now, you know, it's it's got to be, you know, at, you know, Facebook, Google, you know, whatever. Proper Instagram, attribution. Yeah, proper you attribution. Know, you know, what campaign? You got to know what campaign. Um and a lot of my companies that I uh, one one particular company I work with um, called Call Sumo YIB, um, they do um, you know tracking through phone numbers. Mm -hmm. So each each campaign that you do with them um, creates a unique phone number if the people are going to call to make a schedule an appointment in response to the ad. And of course, the number is a dummy number that rings in your dental office. But the fact that that number is called creates a connection to that campaign. And then at each week or each month, you know, Call Sumo is supplying you with a, uh, you know, real analytic data on how effective your campaigns are. So um, the tools to track and analytics are there. Um, dentists need to be a little more savvy on how to understand that data. Awesome. That's great. Well, um, as we start to wrap things up here, really, um, I'm just hoping to get your, your quick hot take on something. And, and that's the million dollar question. And that is, uh, is, is social media the best way for dentists to grow their practice and attract more of the right clients in 2021, in your opinion? So 
the answer is yes, unequivocally. Um, yeah. You know, does a dentist need uh, a Google um, presence and a Google ad, you know, AdWords campaign? Yes, I think, you know, SEO and, and social media, uh, you know, are both part of the puzzle that every dental practice and every small business has to be involved with. People are expecting it and they're looking for it. And, um, you know, people's browsing on the internet starts with social media. And if you're not on social media, you're, you're losing huge opportunity. Um, but, you know, beyond just having a social media presence, you know, which was, you know, adequate, you know, once upon a time, you know, you got to really know how to kill it on social media and how um, to do it. And, and one phenomenon I'm seeing now is the presence in the dental office of a media team. And, yeah. you know, a media team might be one person, but for a larger practice, it might be, um, you know, a whole team of three or four or five people, you know, or more, depending on the size of the practice, that are just geared at handling the office's media, web presence, YouTube channels, you know, videos, Pinterest, you name it. Um, you know, you know, in my in my day, it was, you know, pick the youngest staff member because they knew how to, you know, how to handle and navigate Facebook and answer emails and stuff like that, you know. Um, but nowadays, you know, it's if a dental office doesn't see the need for it or they're too small, then they've got to outsource it, but they've got to have an important member of the team, be it in-house or someone that they've retained that's a media specialist. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you for your feedback on that. And, and Jay, do you have any uh, anything else before we wrap up? One quick question for you. With you being such a trailblazer when it comes to dental technology and technology, we talked about Atari, Commodore 64, and you being cutting edge with all technology, how much credit can you take for Facebook? <laughs> um, I mean, I kind of planted the seeds and let's say the, the, uh, uh, the timing couldn't have been better from our end. I mean, my, my office, after 10 years, that office in our house became our full-time office. We sold the office in Brooklyn. Um, we expanded the office to a four operatory office. Um, I basically lived in the home uh, where I worked. Um, and so as an early adopter back in the early 90s, I, had America online. That was the only way to get, you know, on the internet. And and by 95, we were already doing um, insurance claim processing through dial-up. We were doing credit card processing through dial-up. And I noticed an interesting phenomenon after my kids got computers was that the staff used to come to me, you know, at the end of the day and say, you know, like from 3.30 to like five o'clock, we're having trouble getting credit card processed or, or insurance eligibility verification. And I figured out that my kids were coming home from school and <laughs> we had only one America, we one dial up, one phone line that we used to dial out. So once I realized the issue and I didn't want to, you know, squelch their creativity, I actually brought in a friend's son who had a fledgling business and he wired the entire house at, at that time it was for cat four and we brought a t1 line into the house so in 90 in 95 we had broadband in our house and office and my son mark was 11 at the time and here is this you know little pisher who is uh you know really savvy and bright you know great math mind and whatnot and we gave him his first computer when he was eight or nine and he ate it up and he was learning C++ programming and stuff. And, and here he is with an unfair edge over his friends. Not only did he have his own computer, whereas many homes just had like one computer for the house that had to be shared by everyone. He had his own computer with a full-time broadband access and not just the, that, but he also learned how to, make computers talk to other computers through the network in our home. 
Um, so at dinner one night, I think he was 11 or 12, and I had mentioned to the family at dinner that we were buying this, I was going to buy this Comlight system, which is this like series of colored buttons that go on the wall, which each code would have a different meaning, like a, you know, a red button might be the hygienist needs an exam from her patient, and a green button might be that my next patient's out in the waiting room or whatever, you know? And he, my son looks at me and goes, what, why do you need that? You already have computers in all your treatment rooms. <laughs> I, I can write you a program that your computers can talk to each other and you won't need that. So he did. Um, and it was, called, it was called Zucknet. And it was essentially the first social media program in the world, you know? written by this 12 year old and we communicated with each other from operatory to operatory and my, you know, the house down to the office, you know, telling my wife, Hey, I'll be <laughs> done in 10 minutes, have dinner ready, you know, that kind of thing. So. That awesome. Wow. I love that. What an incredible story. Storm. It was a perfect storm for him that gave him, you know, really an unfair advantage over his peers. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you for sharing that, Edward. I really appreciate that. And without a doubt, there is people listening to this now and in the future that uh, would love to to get a hold of you or find out more about you. And, and uh, where would you like to send them to be able to do that? So they can either message me from at, at my website, which is painlessdrz.com, um, or my Facebook page, which is Painless Social Media. Love it. Okay. Well, definitely reach out. And, and Edward, we want to thank you uh, so much again for coming on to our show today. And we end our episodes with the same question every single week. And that is, if you could choose one person, dead or alive, to represent your brands, who would it be and why? Hmm. Um, you know, I... I I don't see myself so much as a brand as a facilitator or an aide. And I think that, um, you know, for what I do, I think I'm the best person that can do what I do. We'll take it. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much again. My pleasure. Thanks, Edward. Awesome. Another great episode. Edward Zuckerberg on the show. Appreciate his time. We've got a lot of value bombs there, especially for not just dentists, but business owners out there on using social media. And you know, one big takeaway I had from what Ed was talking about was the power of organic. When he was talking about specific tests or, or using your audience to 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 promote your own practice and and you know getting people to check in. I think that is an amazing strategy that does get overlooked by a lot of uh, not just dental practices, but small businesses out there is incentivizing people, enticing people to leverage that check-in because I mean seriously if you see one of your friends check in at a location, that's going to give that location or business a lot of clout. 100% and, and I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that was my biggest takeaway from the from the episode as well, like such an underutilized feature in Facebook and any business that has a physical address uh, or a physical location can uh, can roll that out tomorrow if you want. So uh, start thinking about incentive programs uh, and what to give away on, on how you can in encourage people to check in at your location. And yeah, wow, that was just awesome to have him on the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. We appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe on your go-to podcast channel, and we'll be back again with another episode next Tuesday. Thanks for listening. See you, everybody. Okay, guys.